I was going to say my main objective today is just to, to make sure that you don't fall asleep, but I think the microphone is loud enough. Okay, so they told me to start at uh, 10 past, so we are all, yeah, basically there. So thank you very much and, and, and welcome to this, uh, this session. Um, I'm not really sure how long I have, but let me just, I'll probably use around 20, 25 minutes and then we can have like questions and answers uh, at the end. Um, Quick couple of questions, um, so I get to know you guys a bit better. So who's coming from the public sector? Okay. And then for the whole, for the whole audience, who feels a bit uneasy about the cloud market in Europe? The fact that we have hyperscalers, that the market is dominated by hyperscalers, big tech. Who feels a bit slightly concerned about that? Okay. And who thinks the European Union should invest more on developing European open source technologies? Okay. And then last question. Who knows what the IPSI says is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, spoiler alert, through this project we, that has started already, we are mobilizing 3,000 million euros to build a European alternative for managing the cloud and its computing uh, infrastructure in Europe. So my presentation today is about this project. It's also about the context in, in which this project has emerged and how we are running it right now. And, and how we envision the rest of the European industry and the public administrations to, to join this project in the, in the midterm. So, um, as you can see um, in this slide, the main member states, this is an initiative that has been promoted and launched by, by a number of member states, so 12 member states, um, there you have their logos. Um, it's coordinated by Germany and France, um, but it is, the implementation is in charge, I mean, the, the European industry is in charge of the implementation of this project, okay? IPSI, this means the important project of common European interest on next generation cloud infrastructure and services. That's why we use the shortcut. So the main, the main question here is, can we at this point fix the European cloud market? I mean, um, several of you said that you are concerned about this. So as you know, there have been a number of, um, of um, studies and, and, and analysis on, on how we would like the cloud market to be and what are the main uh, challenges for, for European companies and administrations when they want to use cloud technologies or the public cloud, for instance. So one of these concerns, as, as analyzed with the, the use um, industrial strategy, for instance, is that the Euro European organizations are moving to the cloud, uh, adopting cloud technologies very slowly. Um, the percentage of the, sh of the market uh, that's um, run by European uh, cloud providers is very, very, very small, as we'll see in a second. There has been, there's a, a long term investment gap in what Europe should have been investing in these technologies um, for a long time, and that puts us behind um, US and Chinese um, competitors. And there are also a number of concerns about how safe it is for some data, industrial but also public data, to, to move to the cloud, public cloud providers and some, and some platforms. So this is a bit of a summary of the situation right now. So, if we look at the cloud market, so it's growing a lot, especially during the, during the pandemic or since the pandemic. But the market share of uh, European cloud providers is, uh, is in decline. Very small cloud providers in Europe compared with the, with the big hyperscalers. So they are the ones that are capitalizing on this incredible growth in, in, in public cloud. If we look at the uh, um, system infrastructure software market, um, we see that they, it's mainly dominated by non-EU companies as well. So the companies that produce the technology for, for managing this infrastructure, for commercializing these infrastructures, um, they're also non-European, most of them. 
And then if we look at the open source side of things, if we look at the, what are some of the key technologies that cloud providers or public administrations have been using traditionally for, um, for running maybe their private clouds or setting up their public cloud offerings, some of them um, are largely com controlled also by non-EU vendors. So this means that from a European perspective, we don't only lack the capacity to compete with the big players in the market. We also have um, a challenge when a new cloud provider, for instance, wants to get into this market because the entry barriers are too high because it's already dominated by very big players. And from a technological perspective, our companies are not used to develop the technologies that our governments and, and businesses use for this. We rely on the technologies that all they produce even the open source technologies that uh, we use or we adapt or we sell as companies in Europe, the foundations and the knowledge to develop this in the long term and maintain these projects in the long term is not in, in European hands. It's uh, the presence of European companies and developers is very marginal. Developers employed by European organizations, I mean. So since um, 2020, the European Union has been looking at this challenge and then from um, trying to find an alignment between what's a strategic long-term vision about how to fix this situation, how to uh, address what has been defined as a market failure. We are in a situation now in the cloud market in Europe where it is broadly understood that it, it's not going to be fixed by itself. So we need to intervene in this market. So the players in this market are too big, hyperscalers, big tech, they are too big for Europeans to compete against them. Even if we come together, the you've seen before, the largest European uh, cloud provider has around 2% of the EU cloud market. Um, there's no way European companies can come together and compete against the big tech in the cloud market, and that's a reality. We also don't control the technology that will allow us to do that. But since 2020, Europe has been taking a different approach, and that approach means um, okay, we cannot compete in the cloud market, we cannot recover in the control of this cloud market, but the, the market is changing. How, how many of you are familiar with edge computing as a concept? Most of you, right? So edge computing is, I mean, the idea is quite simple. So instead of having to rely on this kind of centralized data centers, very large infrastructures for the cloud, we decentralize this infrastructure. So we bring these computing capacities as close as possible to the devices or to the users where these workloads have to be processed. So you don't need to move that data to the, I mean, if you are sending a WhatsApp message to your neighbor, instead of having this message going to the Facebook data center in Luleå in northern Sweden to go back to your neighbor, maybe there is something closer that could be processing this, this transaction of data, right? That's a concept. So the the, the decentralization of the cloud infrastructure in Europe. That means we have now a window of opportunity to change that market because the, if we assume this infrastructure is going to change, this new deployments could be controlled instead of being controlled by hyperscalers, they could be controlled by European um, companies and European uh, organizations and bring some balance to that market. So instead of having an oligopolistic structuring of, of the market, we could have something much more diverse where the Europeans can actually have something to say. So since 2020, there have been a number of, um, of initiatives. Um, I want to just point your attention to the, to the member states declaration. Um, and this, sometimes things happen in Brussels, you know, declarations, agreements between member states, decisions, workshops, and, and then we, sometimes we don't really see the real impact of these decisions, right? So in 2020, all 27 member states, and that's a difficult thing to do, get the agreement from all 27, they agreed that Europe needs something different for the cloud, a new approach for the cloud. So we need to deploy as Europeans that we have to speed up that transition from the cloud, um, from the centralized cloud paradigm to the edge computing paradigm, also to allow more European companies to come into this market to leverage on this new infrastructure, new, this new model that we don't expect it will be hopefully controlled by, by big tech or high-speed scalers. And they also mentioned the, the, the how significant this is. It, is, uh, it will be open source and, and standards for, for, this, for this process. So this is a political declaration for all 27 member states back in 2020 to say we need a different approach, otherwise the battle is lost. 
In 2021, they, the Commission went uh, a step um, further and they defined the digital decade strategy, so the, the, the digital compass, you might have heard of this. And they set up um, a specific objective. So if we want to have a decentralized cloud infrastructure in Europe with many more providers, what does that mean in the impractical terms? So they, they, they decided on a, on a figure. I don't know that, where the figure came from. 10,000 edge nodes. That means that instead of having dozens of data centers across Europe, super large data centers controlled by, by normally big tech, we expect an infrastructure with at least 10,000 edge nodes, and we can have long discussions about the, with the telco people about how, what an edge node is, but at least 10,000 edge nodes across the continent that will allow this kind of um, proximity cloud to emerge. So instead of processing your data and your applications in Luleå in Sweden, it might happen in the next, uh, I mean, in the, in the 5G tower next door or in the supermarket across the street. Why this processing has to take place thousands of kilometers away, right? So, nice figure, 10,000 edge nodes. How on earth we manage 10,000 edge nodes? Of, you are an application developer, how can you use this? I mean, because I mean, oh, using AWS is very easy, right? I mean, you get an account, you get APIs, you pay, obviously, and that's it. It's just one interface with one provider, a more or less homogeneous infrastructure there, nice marketing. 10,000 edge nodes, potentially from hundreds of existing or new infrastructure providers across Europe. That's a bit of a mess. So, this movement, I mean, these technical challenges, have, uh, these objectives happened in a specific context. And obviously, the concept of digital sovereignty has, been, has changed in the last uh, few years. We, it's almost everywhere now. We have people like, even people like VMware and Microsoft selling sovereign cloud solutions to their European customers, including public administrations. Um, at the political level, we can see there's been a long process also from the European Commission, more and more explicit in what digital sovereignty means in practical terms. So we have Josep Borrell mentioning this concept of strategic autonomy. Um, we, we have uh, Breton talking about the, the need for European alternatives. We had recently in July, before the, the European Parliament, we have uh, President von der Leyen again stressing how important it is for Europe to develop the strategic technologies that we need. And we need those technologies to be made in Europe. If we want our companies and our industries to be competitive and their technological stack is completely dependent on non-EU organizations, and sometimes even their own competitors, uh, that's not very clever, right? But that's, I mean, that's how it works. I mean, European um, organizations and companies, they've got used to consume technology that others produce. That's cheaper. I mean, it's a bit lazy attitude, but I mean, it's, it's, it's fine, right? I mean, if you walk around, you will see a lot of big providers contributing to open source technologies, and you talk with um, your peers or even your own organizations. I'm sure you, you, I mean, most of you use open source technologies, but will you be able to maintain these technologies in the long term? Do you have the in-house technological knowledge about these, tech these, these, these solutions? The answer most of the times is no. I mean, we rely on others. We are mere consumers of, uh, of, of most of the solutions we need. So the IPSI is intended to change that. And it's, um, I'm going to explain you the details. It's a very peculiar thing. So if some of you are used to public funding or research and innovation projects, um, you must have different experiences with this. It's a bit crazy. You look at this and you say, oh, 12 member states come together, they mobilize on their side on, on public funding, uh, 1,200 million euros, and then the companies come and they, they commit to um, provide another 1,400 million euros to build Build what? I mean, what's, who's going to lead this whole thing? But that's exactly what it is. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this kind of dichotomy. Some, sometimes it's a kind of a paralysis we have in Europe among, I mean, between the concept of having European champions to compete against the Americans or the Chinese. So the decisions should we put all our money on a big European company that can compete in market X with the Americans and the, and the Chinese? 
and the other approach. No, no, member states, they, they, they prefer, obviously, to invest their money on their own national companies. Sometimes that leads to kind of paralysis in Europe, where we, don't, we end up having nothing. We don't have, actually, any way to compete against these, uh, these big corporations. This, I like to see the Ipsheim model, uh, and you'll see the cloud one is not the only one, as something in between. So this is member states coming together, using, in some cases, next generation EU funding, to bring, in this case, 100 companies from these member states to collaborate together and develop software together for the first time. And that software is open source. It is European open source software. And this has ha never happened before. Um, the objectives of the Ipsi Cloud, one of the main objectives is enable this kind of multi-provider cloud edge continuum. So that means the infrastructure that will be available in Europe for developers, for governments, for businesses, it has to be covering, it has to cover everything they might need. It could be a hyperscaler data center, it could be a private cloud, it could be a private edge deployment, it could be a 5G edge deployment, whatever an application developer needs for running these this workloads as close as possible to their, um, to their users or their customers, or in a safe way, you, need, maybe you might need confidential computing, you might need GPUs, whatever you need, we have to aggregate all this infrastructure together. Not just from two or three big, big tech corporations, but from as many providers as possible. And in the expectation that many of these providers will be local, will be developing at the national level, they will be European. This has to lead to this strengthening of the EU digital industry, transitioning from being consumers of technology, even open source technologies, to actively develop open source technologies and other technologies together. And that's the, even among competitors, which is something that we also lack in Europe. And this has to lead to a set of European open source technologies. So it has to be an open source model, but it has to be led by Europeans. And that sounds like a crazy idea. Sometimes we discuss it with people. It's, we want Europeans to lead the whole process. It's like, but wait, why don't you get no big companies on board? It's like, we don't want big, big companies involved in developing what it is a crucial technology, critical technology for Europe. We need this technology to bring a balance to a market where the big tech corporations uh, dominate. You think it's clever to get them on board <laughs> to develop that same technology that's going to create an abstraction layer on top of the cloud providers? It <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Um, and that's the challenge. So if we manage to aggregate, and we will aggregate all these different infrastructure, hopefully from more and more infrastructure providers in Europe, emerging in Europe at these different levels, we need the technology to run that. We need the technology to bring all these resources together, to offer them in a simple way to an application developer, to a company, to use the resources that they need, move away from the cloud provider that they don't like, or it's too expensive, or automate the critical infrastructure they need across this continuum for making sure that the application is running 24 per 7 and managing a number of, of, um, of different kinds of workloads, VMs, Kubernetes. So for everyone to pick what exactly they need to run on an amalgamation of, of infrastructure from potentially hundreds of cl different cloud providers. So that's a, the technical challenge. How are we doing that? The hard way, obviously. We are Europeans, right? So, as I said, we are mobilizing, and this officially was, this was approved officially in December 2023. No big fuss, but it is the largest European, um, I mean, the largest open source um, project in the history of the European Union. I don't know if that, there's ever be, been a, an open source project in the world with 3,000 million euros behind. We might be the largest software project in the history of the world. You know. <laughs> 3,000 million euros. Um, as I said, from 12 members, companies from 12 member states, around 100, most of, most of them private companies, but also some universities and, and research organizations, leading the, and what we call an integrated project to develop and provide the technology for, for whoever wants to have a real sovereign cloud, they will be able to do that. We have to, having to, to, to buy, to get into the uh, marketing trap of the, of the non-EU tech vendors. So we are building the technology that would allow someone to use some of those 10,000 edge nodes, aggregate their own infrastructure, consume from, hyper, from hyperscalers without getting into a vendor locking situation. 
If you've heard about the, um, the hydrogen, big projects, in, have you heard of this big investment in hydrogen at European level, or the semiconductors and all that? So we are at that level. So we are the third of these big European crazy projects, and let's put a lot of money on something. So we are the first software um, project at that level. So we are behind the semiconductors and the hydrogen. Obviously, they got some more money, but uh, this is just the first one. Okay, so this is how strategic this is for, for Europe. Um, we started with seven member states with, um, with what we call direct partners, but we're now 12, with, uh, 12 member states with, uh, with indirect partners as well. Um, and new member states can join. So this is a very specific mechanism by which the European Union agrees to intervene in the market. And if you're aware of uh, how... <laughs> fearful some member states are about, about this word, uh, you will understand the complexity of this. So we, this is not just, um, the, in our case, DigiConnect, uh, the, the tech people saying, okay, let's do this. This goes through a very long process. We've been working on this since 2020 and 2021 um, to make sure that this is approved and this falls under the, um, meets the requirements of competition law in Europe, because this is actually a state aid. So this is governments giving money, direct money to companies to say, you now go together and fix this. So that's what we're doing. In March, we had the, the first General Assembly in, in Brussels. Yeah, we have a mixture of uh, member state representatives and, and some of these 100 organizations. So it's, it's, it's really a big, a big thing. Um, I, I personally chair the, the industry side of things. So the, the, what we call, I mean, there's the General Assembly with these 100 organizations and, and we, we relate to the, to the European Commission uh, and, the members, and the 12 member states and the, the, the supervisory board. So we have to regularly explain to them how they are using um, taxpayers' money um, to deliver what we promised. And this is this integration from different technologies and different projects to, to build something for, for Europe. And this is how it works. This is, these are some of the companies you might, you might um, have heard of some of this. You know, uh, Amadeus, uh, Airbus, uh, Fincantieri, Mondragon. Um, SAP, um, Ionos. So we have some of the biggest names in Europe and also smaller companies as well. The important thing here is not the numbers of the, or the size of the, of the funding or the, or the size of, the, of this group of companies. It's the fact that for the first time, companies that used to be only consumers of technology, they, they changed their mindset. They've said, okay, let's get into building the technology that we need and maintain and train our people and develop things together. And together is the key word here as well, not just on our own or with a few companies in our member state, I mean, our country, because we speak the same language. Blah, blah. No, no, this is people from, you know, we, 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 we kind of speak English all, all, all of us. But uh, this, is, this is, is quite unique in that, in that, uh, in that sense. A number of companies are leading this process. I'll explain in a second how we are approaching this from a technological perspective. And, and then um, Open Nebula Systems and SAP, we, we chair the whole, this whole group of companies uh, before the European Commission of Member States. And this is, this is a, a bit of what, what the architecture looks like. So this is the internal structure of the project, but this is what actually we are, we are also delivering as part of, uh, of the architecture. So the first thing we need is we're bringing together as many infrastructure providers as possible. So we, we, we need to, we have some in the project, but the idea is we will, all, we will also integrate in time other providers. Let's say you are a cloud service provider, you have a bare metal offering, um, and you want your service to be used by customers in Europe. Um, you come to us, you develop the connectors for, for the platform and, and people will be able to consume your services. On top of that, what we need is an abstraction layer. So this orchestration layer um, that creates this, uh, hides this, all this complexity to the, uh, to the applications. So we, we don't want people to take care of, okay, I'm going to use 12 nodes in Belgium, 11 in Luxembourg, and, and 10 have to come from uh, Telecom Italy. So that kind of automation and, and orchestration, and abstraction of this, all this complexity, we are, we're doing that at Workstream 2 level. On top of that, we have people that develop applications like AI, um, data exchange. They need the infrastructure, but they don't need to know all the details. So for them, we're offering this abstraction of the infrastructure with the requirements. They will define the requirements they need for their workloads, and we will deploy them whenever they need dynamically. So you don't need something. You don't deploy that. You don't, you don't, you don't spend your money on that. 
And then the project is looking at what was defined at eight strategic domains or use cases in Europe. So mobility, energy, manufacturing, health, uh, smart cities, tourism, agriculture, and media. So for this specific um, use case, we have companies with expertise. And we will be offering from the beginning, as soon as this technology is ready, specific recipes for companies in this sector to start using our technology. The idea here is, if you follow the evolution of the project, we'll come across a term that's very interesting, spillover. And that's one of the main commitments that we have. So we are receiving money from taxpayers, <laughs> from governments. Um, the commitment is to have an impact of this that's much, much broader. So we have to incorporate other companies, we have to incorporate more cloud providers, even outside Europe. We have to incorporate more technologies here. We have to incorporate application developers and more use cases. So if a new European company wants to develop a solution for, for the health sector, they will know that there is a European alternative. And that's the challenge that we have, to ensure that there is a European alternative for this, because otherwise there won't be any European alternative. I won't go through this because I know you are half has left already. But um, these are some of, the, some of the challenges that we are looking at. So we're looking at tens of thousands of edge nodes across the, across the continent from hundreds of different providers. That brings a new, 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 new number of new security um, challenges. We need automation for this to work. You cannot have the cloud administrator just one by one provisioning edge resources. Um, we assume this hardware will be heterogeneous. Um, we'll need this to be dynamic. Um, we need to make sure that it responds to general purpose applications, but also to specific ones that require some, some specific hardware. So a number of things that we'll be looking at at the technical level, but the concept in itself is not that complex. Now we get into the details and it will become a bit more challenging. One of the main, two of the, the main challenges that we have across these four worker streams is, cyber, as I mentioned, cybersecurity, specific cybersecurity um, um, threats and challenges coming from this new, this new architecture and this new model. Um, also, also in energy efficiency, trying to save and optimize the use of energy across these infrastructures, and also interoperability. But that's, uh, that's something we'll have to um, look at very carefully because, as you know, the more cloud providers you bring to the project, the more complex it is to, to make them interoperable. And this is how it looked like. So, for a specific um, governmental agency or a business that they need to use a number of uh, infrastructure resources, they need their applications, they might be an integrator. So, if you have some needs, the cloud infrastructure won't be a commodity anymore in the sense that you don't have to take for granted that the, your cloud has to be on AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. I mean, that's what, exactly what they want. You, you forget about the infrastructure yet. You forget that they control all the infrastructure. So in this, in this case, the cloud infrastructure, you will be able to pick the cloud infrastructure that you want from the providers that you want. Um, and the whole thing is expected to open up this market to many other players including your own um, fellows in your own member states. What kind of companies are we looking at here? I mentioned supermarkets. I mean, there was some news a few, day, a few days ago about Lidl becoming a, a cloud um, service provider and offering cloud services. Why not? I mean, supermarkets, they, they have the presence in the territory. So we need computing resources as close as possible to users. Deploy them on the supermarket or in your bank office or your railway operators. We have Deutsche Bahn in the project as well or board of a ship. Why not? The hyperscalers don't, ha don't have this penetration in the territory. We have that. The telco providers, they know very well. I mean, they have this presence in the, in the, in the, in the territory, the physical presence. They have the locations, the facilities. Should we just rent them, them to, the, to the hyperscalers to deploy their infrastructure, or we deploy our own infrastructure and we start competing with them in their own terms? That's the whole philosophy. Again, open to anyone else to, to contribute to this. It's open source. The technology will be open source, but will be controlled by European organizations. Open to cloud providers within and outside Europe. If you, are, you have a data center on board of your boat and you're you are sailing to Singapore and you need some additional resources, you might want to consume some resources from, from the harbor there. So we, this continuum has to be global. So we'll make sure that we incorporate also cloud and edge infrastructure providers across the globe. 
That's very quickly because I'm, I, you might have some questions. This is the um, this is, for instance, how our individual project looks like. The Open Nebula Systems project. Um, we are bringing Open Nebula, which is the, we are proud to say it's the only European cloud and its computing platform in the market. Uh, we've also developed through um, a number of uh, European uh, projects, so we're happy to contribute this to to that abstraction layer. And yeah, I mean, I welcome. You, I mean, I invite you to to follow the project. We, you will hopefully you will hear more about this project in, in as we we kind of coordinate our communication actions. Uh, that's also one of the challenges. Twelve member states, commission, hundred companies. We're still working on how we we coordinate the communication for what, as you see, is it's kind of quite a big challenge. But I, I, I'm happy to say it's, I think it's a turning point in in many different things, the cloud market, but also the way in which we develop um, open source in Europe. As you see, many, many companies that one wouldn't expect to see involved in developing open source or developing technologies by themselves, um, here you have them. So also, if you happen to be in Brussels tomorrow or the day after, <laughs> we'll have also a session with the, with, uh, with the member states to present this um, in front of the, uh, the, the cloud edge, um, ecosystem in Europe. So that's all from my side. Hope you're still awake. Happy to get your questions if you have any. Thank you. Yeah, they will be able to do that. So what we are defining now is like um, it's a basic integration between the... Because the funny thing about this project is that there are 100 organizations and you could see these organizations as 100 independent projects. So each organization gets funding from the member state. So they have their own, their own KPIs, they have to justify the funding and the project to the member state. But we also have a responsibility at the facilitation group level to integrate all these projects together. Obviously, a subset of the projects because otherwise it would be impossible. But we will create this integration with all these different technologies. Some, as you see, some partners are technology providers, some of them are cloud providers, telco operators. In that process, we are building and well, defining an architecture that will allow third parties to come in with their own alternatives to some of these components that I showed before. Um, maybe alternatives to what we have in the IPSI, alternatives to what others are offering, uh, but also bring their own extensions, their own infrastructure, their own applications. So yeah, that's the idea. But obviously we couldn't start with everyone, but um, that's the plan. Yeah. So what I see is there is one thing that I believe is very challenging here, is that how much investment is needed before you do the market testing. So it's somehow something I um, very critically look at many of the EU projects is you invest a whole lot of money and you don't know if the market will ever take up on that project mm -hmm. yep. or on the product at the end of the day. So yep. how do you ensure that this is not happening here again? Um, the difference with this project is that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of uh, technology readiness level, so the TRLs in, in European projects, so that kind of, there are, there's a list of uh, how ready your technology is to go to market. So what we're doing here is uh, um, pre-commercial, so we are this, uh, one step away from building a, a commercial product. So we are not, because you cannot use state A to build a commercial product, but we are just there in the step before. So we're building something that either these companies or through these spillovers that I mentioned, all the companies, even our own competitors within the project, have to be able to take from the repo and very quickly transform into a commercial product. Um, that's the difference with, the, with other, other European projects. So this is, this is not run by the research and development teams from this Big companies is run by the commercial and the business units from these companies, and we've had. When, when do you expect something to be ready to be consumed? <laughs> when do you want it? <laughs> Today, tomorrow, uh, maybe third, uh, fourth, fourth quarter of this year. Okay. End of fourth quarter of this oh, year. Maybe end of 2024. That would be nice. Yeah, sure. End of 2024. Okay. We've got an alternative to the hyperscalers using this. Why not? Yeah, sure. 
I mean, we are late already, so in general, not the project, I mean, uh, as Europeans. <laughs> yeah, there will be something by the end of 2024. Yeah. That's our commitment. There will, be, there will be a tangible technological, a first inter technological integration by, by the end of this year. Yeah. Yeah, most of it, yeah. Um, I cannot speak by, I mean, for all 100 organizations, but yeah, the commitment from the from DigiConnect and Digi Competition as well, they understood the multiplying impact of, I mean, potential of open source. So from the very beginning, actually some companies dropped during this long process because they didn't want to de develop this or release it under an open source license. But the ones that, that, that remain, uh, I would say, most of them, 90%, they, they have this commitment to to release this uh, open source. So the, each of them, and if you're around, I you know when an, there might be some announcements these days, but some of these companies might place their projects under the Linux Foundation Europe or the Eclipse Foundation, or they might keep it under their own company, whatever. So we assume each of these projects, each of these companies are developing their own components in under the, the open source model that they want. Um, and then we're bringing whatever we can use from, from each of them together into uh, an integrated platform that people will be able to, to consume, obviously picking the, the components they need. Don't ask me about the lines because we don't know yet. <laughs> Probably Apache. And then the uh, second thing, uh, do you guys, maybe you said it already, but for clarity, do you also uh, try to orchestrate the party such that uh, things are not being done twice or three times? All these goals that not uh, every code from the first half and the second half is missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the one of the main challenges when we have these all 100 companies coming together is identifying exactly what each of them is going to do. Try to rep, I mean avoid rep, um, overlaps. We assume that even within the project, com some companies might be working on the same on, on, on a solution for the same problem. Let's say. Um, so first, what we try to do is to put them together. Look, can you work together on this? Do some research. I mean, there's some research involved, but um, they might end up on their own with different products based on different technologies. But uh, yeah, that's that's one of the challenges that we have. So putting everything together and see when there is some overlapping in some of these boxes. So who is working in operating systems? Maybe we, the initial movement is always to put them, these people together. And so work together on something. Let's see if you can contribute together to, the, to build this component that we need even if later on you, you produce uh, or you end up with different commercial products based on that. Yeah. Maybe another one. So what is the unique selling proposition of this? So besides, of course, this is European. Okay, that's European. But so that at least I believe it needs to be equally good as Amazon, as Google, as Microsoft, at least. Mm -hmm. And so, but what on top do you put on this so that people switch from Microsoft, Google, and Amazon to this one? Mm -hmm. So what is the additional benefit that they get out of this? I think the, I think it, it has a unique way to tackle the concept of vendor locking. And it's not only about the technological dependencies that you develop as an organization, as a customer within a specific cloud provider. It's not just that we are building this abstraction for this new edge infrastructure that doesn't exist yet, we're in the process. It's not that, that only that kind of technical um, dimension there is how it tackles the mental vendor locking. So did, did you ask any large companies and governments if they really care about it, if they really are willing maybe to spend even more on this? Yeah, yeah. Spend? Yeah. There's more funding coming and I mean this is this this comes out of member states. It's not companies saying we want to do this together, give us the money. Yeah. This is the government saying we need to do this. Who wants well, to help? I, I think we need to ask the question then the other way around. We say so at least my perspective it's not enough if only government wants so it's a yeah, of course, yeah. of the industry that needs to want to consume this, and therefore it has to be better than things which are already there. Yeah. At the same the cost, end, the same consumer, price, so the, the, the end entity, yeah. the consumer, that's uh, one, exactly. one of the use cases for his business exactly. or whatever. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good, I mean. He must be convinced yeah. that it's cool and exactly. sexy to use this. Because all 
the others are putting millions in media and everything uh, to convince them it's cool to use their uh, stuff. Yeah. But, that, but that's, that's a, also the unique thing about these companies. I mean, we already have those users here, iconic European industry players, that are already understood they need this. They don't just want to consume this from, from another company. They want to get into the core of development teams and, and make sure that this concept of digital sovereignty implies that they have to be direct control of the technology. Is that what, sorry? They are just talking about it. It's uh, not, nothing serious. Yeah. When it comes to real things like the Embraer rising in prices or mm -hmm. the cloud providers rising in prices, then they would be interested. So this is something yep. uh, um, I would see. So Open Nebula definitely is on the good side because they eff effectively they could probably replace the Embraer on scale. This is something um, they take care of because the, the numbers are so for the German federal government, uh, they raise, raise uh, the uh, number from 460 million for license fees in 2023 mm -hmm. to in a few years more than a billion a yeah. year. So, this is a significant number. Um, before that, they don't even care about. Mm -hmm. So the entire, the entire um, talk about digital serenity is just... Yeah, because uh, yeah, it's difficult. The public. It, yeah. It's nothing serious until it, it, it comes to... It hits you, yeah. No, it, it, when you think about it, it means it's difficult. When we, everyone has, every person has a different concept of what digital sovereignty is. But then when we, we bring that to the, to the ground, so what do you mean by that? So what do we have to do as an organization? What do we have to do as a, as a government? What do we have to do to get the, together as Europeans? This, so far, I think it's the most tangible um, initiative that we can, we can do in this sense. And hopefully will lead to others assuming, I mean, understanding this model, hopefully, I mean, I expect it to work, but also to help people to materialize this concept. Digital sovereignty means this. Mm, no, I don't think so. No, thinking. I mean, not public data centers. No, it's all cl uh, private cloud providers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. As part of the infrastructure layer, for instance. I mean, that's one of the the mandates we have with the Commission to incorporate HPC resources and all that. So, that continuum, we understand it will at some point incorporate also public infrastructure resources. Yeah. I do it for free, I work on the weekends. If I look at uh, the hyperscalers, I think their core property is the operation capabilities and automation. So I don't think anyone will reinvent the operating system nowadays. Otherwise, just spend it to, like we have done the keynote today, to the kernel developers getting mm -hmm. some money there. But how are you actually going to make that operational model codified and reusable? Because that's something where you actually spend a lot of money on day to operations. And there are some small open source projects in that area, but I assume that if you take a lot of investment to make sure it can be easily deployed, made consumable, because no one will reinvent it. I'm pretty sure 80 90% will be based on today's open source technologies or being invented Good in that area. Mm -hmm. So the question really is what is the real innovation coming out of this besides reuse of open source technology? And secondly, how to actually make that operation model, which is a core competency of the hyperscaler. So the, the first question is yes, I mean there is a component here of reusing things and that's also one of the objectives of this is let's try to reuse as much as possible, especially from the previous um, research and development projects at European level. So now that's one of the challenges that we have in general when we talk about funding for, for this kind of technologies. We have a number of projects running under Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020 developing these technologies. What happens afterwards? Who knows? Uh, but the idea is we're trying to build this also as a framework for future uh, research projects to have some baseline technologies or some baseline platform for them to tackle specific research gaps and challenges in, in afterwards. 
So we, we, we hope this will also help to orchestrate this kind of larger EU initiatives in, in, in developing new technologies, developing existing ones, but developing the integration between them much more um, efficiently. The operational side of things, um, we try to focus on the, the main challenge that we have is to build something that um, someone else can apply and can deploy on, on specific scenarios. Um, but our main challenge at this point is the it's a technological integration. So what the, the piece if you what, if you ask me what's the piece missing here? Sorry, what it is? It's the the, the system integrators. So we need uh, once this technology is available and this um, recipes for deploying specific components for a specific use cases is available. What we need to be much more active is in engaging with system integrators that will bring this to the market. So they, they will help to deploy this, operationalize this in a specific sectors with this, for a specific companies. And that's also one of the challenges that we have. We, you mentioned this migration from VMware to or, or something else, OpenNebula or some other technologies. The problem that we have, we're facing is in the change itself in the people in this company. So the, the, the resistance we get in, not only in the integration, the technological integrations with other components or the infrastructure in these companies, it's also about the, um, the people that's been managing this. So we have to train the people to, to use this technology, to develop these kind of in-house capabilities. And that's a challenge that we'll have with this as well. So we can offer this as a super nice alternative to something. But um, we, for this to be applied in, the, in a specific company, we will need the integrators and we will need to convince the cloud administrators that they can use this in an, in an easy way. So that's, that's one of the challenges that we have. So it won't be easy, but at least the technology will be there, <laughs> which is more than we have now. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> no. no. But there's still room. I mean, the, this, this IPSI model, um, it's open to new member states to come. So they go through a process of um, um, defining how much funding they want to incorporate. They look for the companies. So there's a call for companies to participate. So it's always like an, it's an ongoing process to incorporate new member states and more, more companies. Not now. So not, not now the companies are, and the whole governance model is based on these 12 member states and the companies within the project. Afterwards, when we open up this kind of framework for integrations, then yes, I mean, we will have to incorporate other people, other companies, even from outside Europe. Um... I think I'm, no, no, no. I think we, I think we, we probably need the hyperscalers here as well. I mean, if we want, I mean, the, the power of this, uh, you talk about the, the, the um, selling point, right? So th this will make too much sense if we only have European cloud providers here with this two percent, four percent of the market. So we need, we need their infrastructure as well, but we need um, companies to have something in between, so they don't, they don't develop this vendor locking um, with the specific providers. Also, the, also the technologies themselves. I mean, the uh, the, the ones that are now more <laughs> reluctant to change from VMware to something else is the, the, the technical people now in the in this in these companies because they they don't have the, the, the capabilities, they don't have the knowledge, they lost that 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 knowledge in their in their company. So we need to make sure that we build the technology, but also we train and we have some commitments. We even we to train our competitors in these technologies. Of course, yes. <laughs> they could join, yes. <laughs> No. The, the bigger companies will create the project management and compliance and no, no. whatever uh, analysis, analysis, analysis uh, uh, mess. And, and uh, the only thing I would pro um, propose for this some um, limit the size of a company that, that can join. <laughs> And these are not engineering companies. These are 
management company, and this is a problem with it. Yeah. I've, I've been part of Gaia X, and, and then they made an architecture mess uh, forever, and the result was more or less nothing yeah, yeah. compared to the size of the uh, and, and the volume of, of the budget. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, oversized in this. Uh, yeah. That, that's why everyone expects this to fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would expect to have them competition in the areas and they kind of have to do corporations to suck in the money. So it's kind of counterproductive setup right now. Yeah. Good thing is that we got green light from uh, DJ competition. So we're clear. There is no competition between Siemens and SAP. It's simply not. Maybe not now, but, the, but we, between them and other companies out, out there, there is. And actually, in some of the commitments we have at the, at the individual level is um, opening up this new infrastructure to other companies. We have to train our competitors. We have to make this technology available. So there are a number of very specific requirements in terms of uh, making sure that this is not just a group of companies doing something for their own benefit. But yeah, I understand what you say. There are engineers in the project. We are an SME, for instance. There are other SMEs in the project, so it's not only uh, big, uh, big corporations, big European companies. The ones that are involved, I have to say, after working with them for th three years, they, are the, they have the right approach this time. <laughs> so I have, I have, um, I'm hopeful that, that we will deliver and we will make um, people um, hopeful again that we can, we can do this by ourselves. I know the, the history of these kind of corporations and, and, and that's not very, it's not very uh, successful, but yeah, I mean, we all understand where we come from. This is also, I would say, a consequence of these experiences. I mean, maybe without some experiences in the past, we wouldn't be here. So the approach of these companies is also different. The commitment of at the individual level of the people involved in this project is also different. So yeah, end of the year, we said, right? Hopefully we're not making the same mistakes twice. Hmm? Mistakes. New mistakes, yeah, but not 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 the old ones. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.